On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass Amherst student Maura Murray disappeared in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. For years, we have covered Maura's case and the tireless online community that surrounds it in great detail. We have since expanded our mission with this series, raising awareness and shining a light on the stories of other missing persons. We now sit on the board of directors of the nonprofit organization Private Investigations for the Missing, which was founded by Bruce Maitland. Bruce's daughter, Brianna Maitland, went missing from Montgomery, Vermont on March 19th of 2004, just six weeks after and about 80 miles away from where Maura Murray vanished. Private Investigations for the Missing aims to assist with investigations for underserved families whose missing loved ones have been forgotten by the media or by law enforcement. Through our growing community, we hope to shed a light on these cold cases. Families and loved ones can reach out to us at investigationsforthemissing.org. This is Missing. Welcome back to Missing. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing really well. How are you today? I'm doing pretty well, Lance. It's warming up here in the Northeast. That's always a good thing when spring arrives. And we speak to our good friends, Chloe and Melina Cantor, the true crime twins, on this episode. And of course, we speak a little bit about Brianna Maitland's disappearance. And Lance, this episode, actually, I want to say most of this episode was recorded live on Get Vocal a few weeks ago in our True Crime Thursday night slot, 9 p.m. Eastern, that we do every Thursday night. But we're going to play some clips from the True Crime Twins interviews with a couple of Brianna Maitland's old friends. That's Katie Manning and Kira Trombley. Right. Uh, Chloe has done, and, and Melina, the True Crime Twins, they've done a really great job establishing these relationships with the, the family and friends of Brianna Maitland. And it's important to note that these are genuine relationships. These aren't something that is a, a, acquired and then left uh, after the interview is done. Like they continue to maintain these strong ties with Brianna's friends and, and her family. And it shows, too, in these interviews. You can hear the emotion and you can hear just the genuine human-to-human connection that they have. So uh, highly, highly recommend checking out their work on Brianna Maitland. Absolutely. And you can check that out on your favorite podcatcher. There are links in the show notes. Or you can go to crawlspace-media.com and check out all of our shows, our great shows on the network. True Crime Twins is one of them. Make sure to subscribe. Their coverage on the Brianna Maitland disappearance is really personal, as you as you noted, Lance. It's uh, it's really interesting. No one's really done uh, what Chloe and Melina have done about Brianna Maitland. Okay, thanks a lot for listening. Follow us at Missing CSM on social media. Chloe and Melina Cantor, the True Crime Twins. How's it going? We are doing awesome. Thank you so much for having us on tonight. I miss you guys. Oh, we miss you too. We miss you too. My God, it's been like 17 years and, and neither of you have aged at all. <laughs> it's wonderful. Healthy. But it, really, it's been far too long. My goodness. And I was thinking about just reminiscing in my head over some of the times we've had together and... Uh, I remember that we were together when the nickname Lancy Grace was born. <laughs> and that was that was something that you had come up with. And it was, I believe, if I remember correctly, it was because Lance and Melina were having a screaming fight about the Maura Murray case. Close. I have never screamed in a fight before. <laughs> Maybe I was screaming. I don't know. <laughs> No, it was it was Lance in a I won't, I won't say screaming. It was an intense conversation, uh, but with John Smith. Oh yes, 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 yes. I was really hoping that it would have been a screaming 
match with Melina. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a part of the conversation where the discussion of, you know, the sighting of someone smoking a cigarette in, in the vehicle was discussed. Oh, yeah, that and, was a fight. And Melina said, well, I've been in a car accident and I didn't drop my cigarette. I I did drop my cigarette, or, or but I, I picked it up. <laughs> right, picked it up, and then and then Lance was like, "No way!" And she was like, "So you think I'm a liar?" He's like, "Yeah, I think you're a liar." <laughs> that was the first time I met you. <laughs> ah, well, I got to uh, come out of the gate with a good first impression. Hey, if where where to go from there? It's all up after there. That's so Lancey Grace, though. It is. Oh my god. That is. You just you, the first time you meet someone. You just, no, no, I don't believe you. Yeah, I think you're lying about that. Hey, how's it going today? They say fine, and I go, "You're such a liar. <laughs> you're not fine." But I mean, we haven't fought in a long time. But I think that <laughs> sometimes true. friends fight, and that's okay. <laughs> that is okay. Yeah, I mean, if you're not firing each other up, if you're not challenging each other, then what do you have? You just you're talking like you're literally talking into the cliched echo chamber, which is just not fun. It's fun for the person who's doing the talking because you get to be agreed with and you feel good. But if you're not challenged, um, I think that uh, that you're definitely lacking something, which is why your show is so good, because you two challenge each other. Oh, yeah, we try to. I, I think that it makes it more compelling to listen to when you actually hear two different sides. And sometimes we will go for a case specifically because it's something that has polarized us. Because I like the idea of us like actually getting into a fight. And sometimes I provoke her and she doesn't bite though. Like she never like. Yeah, sometimes I'm just like, oh, you're right. But then other times I'll, you know, stand my ground. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like when, when there's a big throwdown. It's a good way to learn, I feel like. I think uh, that is one way to kind of retain information i think definitely it's like a debate well when when you melina say oh no i'm you're right that's good we can move on is that your way to just kind of poke back you know because does that irritate chloe like no i need this i need you to not agree with me honestly though no it's because i i literally back down because i feel i, I don't know i think it goes back to like a dynamic where yeah. she was the dominantly speaking one so if she is going on about a point and is really committed to it, I kind of just like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'd say that speaks to the dynamic, too. I, I definitely have a bit of a stronger personality. But with John Bonet, I stood my ground. <laughs> you guys are identical twins, right? Yeah. Who was born first? Who do you think was born first? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with Chloe on that. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Safe guess there. Yeah. Well, tell us about your backgrounds. What do you two do? Why do you do this podcast? So I work for a small town government where I uh, am an advocate for senior citizens. I advocate for them in a number of ways, um, just making sure that they have all of the resources that they need available to them. Uh, right now, a lot of it has to do with the pandemic. But, you know, the, the criminal justice system does enter. You know, there's a lot of... Um, elder abuse and we're noticing that increasing now so it all kind of um connects so that's my that's my day job and i really do love it um and i do this too uh, which is you know something i really enjoy especially because i get to do it with her both of us studied psychology initially and we've we have always just loved anything that involves abnormal psych forensic psych true crime always die hard forever um, we both went that route, but we kind of both sort of to linger, but I feel like that true crime is definitely like my still number one passion. Um, now I'm in nursing, which I love not much true crime there, but, um, I'm like a boss, which is cool. <laughs> what do you mean by that? You're a boss. You're, you're, yeah, like if, a, you're if you're nurse a nurse passion? like on the unit, you are responsible for everybody, including like the other employees that are underneath you. So like whatever anybody else does, it reflects on you. How long have you been doing that job? I have been there since November. I work at a subacute rehab, but I think one day I might want to move to a hospital. But right now I'm really enjoying the environment. I love my residents. They're really cute. And I learn new things every single day. Melina, you went to UMass nursing school, just like Maura Murray was enrolled in when she went missing. And Chloe, I don't know if you want to get into this, but um, you're you're going, you're furthering uh, your education with something with, with criminology, right? Yeah, um, I'm in I'm in graduate school. Um, I just finished like the first level where you can get like your graduate certificate. 
So mine was in forensic criminology. And then I have six more classes until I get my master's in criminal justice. So it's very exciting. My, my bachelor's is in psych. I transferred schools undergrad and the program that I went to first didn't have a criminal justice program. I think if I could go back, um, I would have double majored or something. I, I minored in CJ, but now I get to kind of specialize there. And I, I mean, it's it's really nice when I'm taking coursework and I'm reading something I'm like, oh, that would be really good for my podcast or that really relates to this or that. So it's, it's honestly all working together pretty nicely. But um, I just I couldn't see myself stopping my education there. So very exciting. And how much of that was inspired by Chief Lou? I'd say a lot. He's been like such a good mentor to me. Um, we, we live close by and he's always been just like very helpful in connecting me with people if I need anything at all. He's just a, one of those really good people, good friends. Um, and he got his master's in CJ and, and he teaches um, CJ at college campuses. And yeah, I, I would say he's in, that he's encouraged me to to continue my education. Chloe and Melina Cantor, you have been covering Brianna Maitland's case on your podcast, True Crime Twins. And please tell us a little bit about that coverage and how that's been going. We started the show last year, and that was like one of the more frequent requests that we would get because they know that this is something that that I've had a hand in researching for a while now. And I have my blog, which has a good amount of articles. Um, I, I spent I spent a good amount of time just making sure that they were as comprehensive and accurate as possible. I don't want to do any part in... It's a good authority on the case. Like, if you search for her, I'll see your blog, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> and I've found that it's been cited, too. Yeah. Like there's a new website that just came out recently that's, like, that has a timeline. It has all the media together, and, and my blog is pretty much, like, their primary source. No, it's um, really good and very thoroughly researched. Thank you. Uh, so, so with that foundation and with the relationships that I had formed from interviewing her friends, and I feel like I, 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 I feel very fortunate that that they've opened up to me the way that they have. I, I felt like you know, kind of give the listeners what they want while also using our platform to keep Bree's name out there because I really care about her name staying out there because that's one of the ways that we're going to get justice. Chloe from crawlspace.blogspot.com. What was it that drew you to Brianna's disappearance uh, initially? And what was it that kept you on it? I think it was the car yeah, in the barn. A house. It's a house. Okay. It's, it's, isn't it called? What is the house called? The Dutch Burn House. Okay. I, maybe I'm thinking the old weathered barn. It kind of looks like a barn. Uh, back in the early days, Everyone would say, I mean, I said barn a thousand times because everyone had said, I think, I think the early Wikipedia page said her car was backed into a barn. So um, I think that's probably what the first thing I read about it. But yeah, yeah that, like, I, I see a picture of this girl and she's adorable. And you read a little bit about her story that she was like kind of redeeming herself, getting her GED. She had a little bit of a troubled past. And then she just has the most bizarre disappearance and it's like maura murray's with the strange car trouble and there's just no trace and everybody has a theory now tell us about these uh two recent interviews you've done uh katie manning and kira trombley these were brianna maitland's friends yeah two women that i've been in touch with over the years who have been very helpful um or tried to be as much as they can it's hard talking to them because there's a lot of pain. These conversations with her friends, what I think it's not like explicitly discussed, but I think what the listener can gather is that Brianna was kind of isolated from uh, a lot of her social supports at the time of her disappearance. Like she had made the decision to move out of her parents' house. And from there it was not stable. Her things had kind of fallen apart with her group of friends at Mrs. Qua, um, high school and then again at Enosburg Falls High School after she had that falling out with Keeley. Uh, and it's sad to think about, but it's it, it's it just kind of shows that the conditions were so that it was it was like a perfect storm for something like that to happen to her because she had fewer supports than ever. Growing up and uh, being in that same area, do you think that Katie was or has any sort of feeling like if it wasn't Brianna that this would happen to 
why wasn't it me? Do you get the sense that like there's some guilt there, some survivor guilt for some reason? Possibly. I think there would be more of that if they had a better understanding or theory because their their minds change all the time about what they think might have happened. So I think it's kind of hard to have survivor's guilt about something if you don't even have speculation about what it could be. So I, I, th- I think they definitely feel guilty, though. I think they feel guilty that, it, and they both will say this openly, that they had similar troubles to Brianna. Kira said repeatedly, we all did things like that. That's just how things were. And we all got to kind of learn and, and live out the rest of our lives, and she didn't. Tell us what uh, what Bruce said about Kira. That was a pretty emotional uh, part of the interview. She kind of... Um... She got emotional. Way, maybe a year ago, um, Bruce was enthusiastic about the idea of the blog and had offered to answer questions from people. And Kira, um, she didn't submit any questions. She just said, you know, I, I, I miss Brianna so much. Um, and I'm, I, I, I'm very impressed by everything that you're doing. And I didn't publish this uh, because it was clearly just like a, a little conversation between the two of them. But Bruce had said, his answer was simply uh, Kira was a true friend to Brie. And it, I mean, it just says everything. Bruce is, is uh, he's not the type that's just going to talk and talk and say anything unless he really has something to say. And he's concise. And when he speaks, it counts and you can hear it from talking to Kira. She was the mother hen um, and was protective of Brie and, and took good care of her. And that was something that was not lost on Bruce. I did want to say that, you know, Bruce Maitland, Brianna's dad, made the comment that, that you were a true friend. That you are a true friend to Brie. And I just think that's very powerful because even though you weren't, that you weren't really talking close to the disappearance, I mean, that that, that kind of resonated with him, the way that you treated it and looked after her. Thank you for telling me that. That means a lot to me. You're welcome. You know, I, I can see that this, I mean, this, this is very painful to this day. It's like the memories of the particulars fade, but that pain is, that that's, that doesn't just go away. No, it doesn't. No, it, does, it doesn't at all. I, I'm triggered by it or about it constantly, constantly. Um, it's, it's changed my life significantly, significantly. Um, I had another another friend who is similar to Bree and her and her personality that when we went to Daytona uh, Beach for Bike Week, um, she would just like pop out of the one bar and go into the next, and I like lost it on her. <laughs> um, you know, cause I just freaked out on her. I'm like, no, you need to like let me know if you go into the bathroom or like you know someone's got to know where you are. And uh, you know, I remind people of Bree. As like a cautionary kind of story. Yeah, and I, I even have started to mention her to my daughter, and I'm, I need to be careful about it and do it the right way because, um, I want my daughter to be healthily aware of, you know, what the real world is, but I don't, I don't want to, like, put this awful fear in her. But I have told her that I have a friend that is, is gone and we don't know where she is. Um, that not everyone is safe out there. And and she says, let's go look for her. That's what she said. She said, let's go look for her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. It's wicked hard. It's super hard. I can't even imagine her parents and her brother. I can't even imagine. Me either. Especially now, you know, seeing it from the perspective as as a parent, it, and you saw it before and after because you know you weren't you weren't a mother when she went missing, and now you are. Bree and Kira kind of met each other before Brianna met uh, some of her other friends. Yeah, um, she first attended the high school in Swanton when she was living with her parents in Franklin. She she lived in Franklin until until her birthday. Um, I think it was yeah, her 17th birthday in October. Uh, and then she transferred schools um, because she moved out of her parents' house and moved to Enosburg and lived with Katie for a time. 
So before she had transferred and met all of those girls at Enosburg, um, which were like Katie, Megan, Keely, Sydney, Hillary, Robitelli, she was friends with Kira and, and those girls. Um, in middle school, she was friends with Jillian Stout. Uh, they had kind of grown apart after she had transferred. But once she had the falling out with Keely and had nowhere to live, uh, she and uh, Jillian reconciled and moved on with their friendship like nothing had ever happened. And uh, sorry if I'm putting you in, on the spot with this one, but um, why do you think Bruce said that to uh, about Kira? I, I think just from what he observed at at the time when they were friends, I don't know if if he frequently saw their interactions with each other or if he's just basing this off of how Bree described her, or maybe he's basing it off of how she's conducted herself since the disappearance, but. I, I can see it clearly when I talk to her. I, I, I just think you can see how much she loves Brianna. And they, they hadn't they were, hadn't talked or seen each other for, for months and months and months before she went missing. But, you know, the memories fade, but the love does not die. And, I mean, it's a heartbreaking interview. I, I, w- once we stopped recording, I kind of just, like, got a little bit emotional. And we talked for a little while. Um, and I know it was, it's, it's hard for them to do. It's, it takes a lot of energy. With this uh, disappearance, there are these images that uh, we had just talked about what, what drew you into the case, one of them being the car that is backed into the Dutchburn house. And we were wrestling with, <laughs> when we were recording something, uh, we were wrestling with what word to use. And I had I was talking, I said, it's like an iconic true crime image, but you don't want to put it on a pedestal like that. So we didn't use the word iconic. It's just what came out. It it stands out like an iconic image. The other image that stands out when you think of Brianna Maitland's disappearance and the negative is the image of her with her broken nose and the black eyes. And you have talked with uh, Keely about this or not about that specifically, but you've communicated with her. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your communication with this person and maybe a little bit of background for anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Sure. Uh, three weeks before Brianna went missing, uh, she was the victim of an assault from her friend. Um, it's described as a fight. I've called it a fight just because clearly the the two were at odds, but it was a one-sided assault um, that ultimately led to Brianna having a concussion, a broken nose, and two black eyes. There was a party at a place called the Pallet Factory. Brianna had shown up with James Robitelli, according to accounts, and Keely was threatening to beat her up throughout the night. Brianna was kind of tired of it and walked out and was later confronted by Keely when sitting in a car and was punched in the face twice in front of witnesses. Keely was hard to lock down. She was hard to reach. I think a lot of people don't like talking about this. I think it's painful for them. I don't want to like, I, I don't want it to be like a point against her that she's been difficult for me to lock down. I, I just feel like everybody deals with this differently, but she she has been. But finally, I was able to get her for a conversation at like 1230 at night and we talked for two hours because that's when she was free and I was like determined to to really talk to her and you know something that struck me was like she was still so mad about her fight with Brianna like it was I don't don't know how many years had passed at that point maybe 14 or 15 years had passed sorry she was still mad at Brianna or what was she mad at she was just mad um the situation yeah like she spoke positively about Brianna you know said that she was just the nicest person and and was so affectionate and and was so fun but once she started kind of going back and and going deep into the story and and you know how how she learned that that Brianna had kind of betrayed her she was so angry (laughs) just just reliving the memory I don't blame her like I, I haven't been in that exact situation, but I was in my hometown today um, to see my mom. And I was driving past this girl's house who I used to be friends with, who kind of betrayed me in a similar way. And like, I'm so over it. Like, I don't even care about the guy and like, I don't care about her. But at the same time, I was like, I want to knock down her mailbox. <laughs> like, it's still getting angry. <laughs> but the the timing of it is just really bad. And do you think that, 
do you think that the timing angers her more than the actual incident itself? Because, yeah, you want to knock down this other person's mailbox, but, you know, given the opportunity, you're probably not going to do it now. If Brianna was around, given the opportunity, do you think that she would punch her in the face again? Or is she that type of person still? Or is she mad that, like, of the timing of it? Like, like, why is everyone looking at me on this? Because I got pissed at someone. We were 17 years old and I lost my temper. And it sounds like, I mean, from from how both Katie and Kira describe, it sounds like they were all pretty feisty. Like, they, they would specifically say that they were feisty. They had fight in them. They would fight. Katie said that she had seen Keely knock people out with one punch. Like, so she was, like, she specifically said she punches like a man. So yeah, these these people... It was it was just a kind of a, a tougher culture. It's just not like, and we've talked about this on our show. This just wasn't really what girls did at our high school. Um, but the thing is, to answer your question, is they were all mad at her. All the friends, all of them, they were all mad at her, which is typical, you know, on behalf of someone they they felt that one friend betrayed the other friend, and they all rallied behind who they see who they saw as the wronged party. Um, I think. I mean, slut shaming is something that's still a thing, but I think in 2004, there were much fewer checks and balances on slut shaming. And um, yeah, Kate just writes mean girls. Um, Yeah. And a hard part of my conversation with Katie was her describing the last time she saw her, you know, Kira has this, has this heartwarming, heartbreaking story of Brianna just showing up out of the blue on her birthday to give her a present. Um, And that being the last time, Oh, I, you know, I have my grandpa's car Katie's I I would be devastated if I were her that the last time that you saw your friend you laughed at her you know but you know they're they're teenage girls they're kids but but they were all mad at her and here is a clip from the true crime twins episode where they spoke with Katie Manning Brianna's old friend it's so it's been you know almost 16 years the the date is March 19th so that's I mean it's it's getting to be almost longer than she was alive it's 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 wow. un- it's terrible and in such a small town where you can keep nothing secret up here nothing nothing <laughs> like everybody knows everything about everyone i mean quarantine helps that chill a bit but <laughs> <laughs> well it's funny that you say that because you know there's been so there's been so much rumor in this case like and, and you've heard it all <laughs> you know from from day one all, all these horrible stories that have never been able to be substantiated so someone could say oh well like you know katie just said no one can keep a secret up here maybe that's that's the result of that maybe all these rumors are just the truth but have you ever thought that maybe someone was spreading rumors on purpose yes yes definitely definitely to get i don't know I was, I've been paranoid about everybody. Um, (laughs) You know, Keely, for example, has been a good friend for 20 years and there's times I've questioned her. There's, I don't know. It's, it's a crazy situation to have to live through. It really is. It is. And and Mike was your friend too. And I know that your perspective is different now, but like having to, having to question people that are, that are in your circle is bad. It's yeah. scary. <clears throat> so when you when you questioned Keely, did you ever like say anything to her face, or was it all just kind of? No, no. I yeah, we spoke about it a few times. Um, the concerns that I had, or things that don't sit right with me, and she has eased my mind enough. You know. Yeah. It it's hard. We. We're both addicts. We're both in recovery. Um, I know how well my memory doesn't work. (laughs) So I'm sure that she has the same thing. So there's going to be questions that are unanswered because I didn't think to ask them until we were in our 30s. You know? And and, and who knows, maybe some of the things that don't sit right are things that were said because of lapses in memory. You know? Right. Because there were a couple things, you know, just like I've heard different things about who was at the party. Like, um and where the assault took place and i and i don't know if that's willful dishonesty from anybody or if it's just they don't remember because it's so long ago and everyone was using drugs and so just and and i know that we've been through this but for people that haven't heard your perspective of it 
um, you were at that party. Who was there that you remember? Um, Keely had rode with my then boyfriend and I. Um, my brother was there. Um, Tyler Stone was there. That was Megan's boyfriend at the time. Meg was there. Um, James. Um, there was a bunch of people, but Brianna was there, obviously. Uh, Hillary. Uh, and I think that's it off the top of my head anyway. Yeah. Do you recall her showing up with James? I remember her sitting in James's truck. I don't remember them pulling in, but I, I do remember her sitting in the passenger seat. <clears throat> he said that she was kind of like threatening her and trying intimidating her throughout the evening before that assault happened. Did you see any of that? I did. Um, really scary. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, we were all maybe 120 pounds at the time, but Keely was the one you didn't want to mess with. <laughs> she hits like a man. Um, and she, yeah, I remember it was two rooms that the party was in. And like the first room was where most of the people stayed throughout. And then the second room was a, a pallet shop, I guess, where they build pallets. So there was a bunch of pallets in that other room. And I remember Brianna at one point going in there and Keely followed her and I followed Keely because I know what's going to (laughs) happen. And uh, they had words at that point. Brianna really didn't say much back to Keely other than the fact that she was sorry. um, And that wasn't enough for Keely. So Brianna wanted to leave and she went out and was waiting for James to take her home. And that's when Keely went out. She told her to get out of the truck. Brianna refused. She said, get out of the truck. I'm going to hit you. <laughs> and, you know, she hit her twice that I remember. And that was the result. <clears throat> did you, she sorry. just took her. Go ahead. Did you, did you actually see her get hit? Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. That was probably pretty brutal to witness. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. Someone sitting, you know, I mean, I don't know if her seatbelt was in, you know, sitting in a, in a, in a car seat, you're kind of in this prone position. You can't really get anywhere. And, and to have someone wailing you in the face through a window, but you said she hits like a man. So that's, had, by the way, did she, has she ever hit you? Is, is that how you know? <laughs> I've just seen her knock her share of people out. Okay. Oh yeah. So, so that wasn't the only fight you've seen her uh, start. Okay. We were an overly feisty bunch, (laughs) to say the least. So did James witness it too? I I don't know. I don't know. I remember Keely and I and my then boyfriend on the passenger side of the car. And I I don't remember anybody other than that. There could have been a ton of people there. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Oh, oh, you mean like outside watching? Right, right. Huh. Because I could see, like, people, like, especially, like, immature, drunk people being, like, thinking that would be something to see, which is, obviously, it's not. It's terrible. Right. Yeah. I would imagine, because everyone knew it was going to happen, so I'm sure that there was other people around. There had to be. Oh, was Keely telling everybody that she was going to beat her up? I mean, she was telling Bree she was going to beat her up in front of everybody, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, because when she said she was intimidating her and threatening her, I, I don't know exactly what she was saying. She was saying, I'm going to kick your ass at, you know, later outside. Yeah. Okay. Get ready to fight. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know? And then James took her home. She didn't get out of the car. Uh, James got right in the car and took her home, and that was, that was the end of it. That was it, yeah. Were you around when Keely was charged for the crime? Yeah. Um, like, I don't remember her getting picked up by the police or anything like that, but I rem- remember Keely telling me that she was getting charges pressed on her. Was And how was Keely feeling about that? Was she upset? Like, I, I imagine she would be. Yeah, definitely. But I also remember, I don't know if it's just because I knew Brie or if it was actually a thing that was said, that we knew that the charges weren't coming from Brianna, but from her parents, you know? So it was kind of like a, I don't know what that mattered, but it did. <laughs> so, so she was probably a little bit surprised because you guys are saying like, this wasn't 
that wouldn't be Brianna's behavior to press charges. Even if mm-hmm. she was injured and upset about this incident, she wouldn't do that. No, no. So that's just kind of like not being a snitch kind of attitude or? Exactly. <laughs> so you- <laughs> And she kind of, you know, she kind of knew she screwed up. I mean, not that she deserved what she got, but a smack would have been okay, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Up that is, you know? I think that Kaylee is mad about the timing of it because it, it is terrible. Like somebody just said, yeah, Shannon said now she's known forever as the girl who punched Brianna. And that has definitely affected her life and affected her reputation. And it made her probably hesitant to talk to Chloe because she didn't want to talk to anybody. And it's crazy that Chloe even got to talk to her. But um, I think that she probably feels like it's really unfair if, if she didn't have anything to do with this, that like, obviously, she shouldn't have punched her, but, like, probably one of her worst moments of her entire life is just being echoed by us and everybody, like, in the media. <laughs> because, you know, the timing. I would be angry, too. One of the uh, things that Bruce had said about that encounter, and I don't know if he's talked to, to um, either of you any further about that, uh, is that, do you remember? He might have said that when we met him that time, uh, when he said uh, he he was very confident that, uh, Brianna let her do that. He 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 basically said Brianna could have taken care of herself in that situation, and she was sucker punched. I don't know why that memory of Bruce stands out to me so much. He just had so much confidence in his daughter, rightfully so. And and I remember him just saying like, "Yeah, no, she was sucker punched, and you know, Brianna let her do that." Well, Bree was taking self defense classes. I think uh, Kira said two or three different kinds of self defense too. Jiu-jitsu just being one of them. I think she was a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and, and Kira had actually seen Brianna um, like kick, a, do like a, I don't know what kind of kick, but like she had like jumped in the air and did a spinny kick and like threw someone against, the, like a man against the room, because, like across the room rather, um, which like shocked everybody with her strength. Roundhouse <laughs> kick, roundhouse <laughs> kick. And so people didn't expect that about her. I think if she were in a situation where someone was significantly larger or stronger than her, or if she were outnumbered, um, it might not have mattered. But I think, although Keely was tough and as people said, hit like a man, I think Brianna could have held her own in that situation. But I think, um, I think I agree with Bruce that she chose not to. I think she was probably punishing herself because she probably felt like a piece of garbage, especially because all of her friends hated her. She probably felt like she deserved it. Yeah. Yeah. I think you might be right with that. Yeah. Because the descriptions we've heard uh, of Brianna are, you know, she's scrappy and she's spunky and she's tough, even even though she only weighed, I think, 120 pounds or something like that. So uh, she could handle her own, um, especially for her size. But just based on that scrappy description, you just, I, I don't feel like she would have backed down or just like taken a beating for no reason. Right. I, I think I think why that comment that Bruce made stands out to me so much is because I think about the scene where her car was found and how it's I mean, at first glance and you <laughs> at, at and in, and even in further inspection, it seems like there was a struggle at the car. And I try to imagine what kind of struggle that would be when someone who's trained in those disciplines, those self-defense disciplines, realizes the danger they're in. Because there's one thing with saying, this is a fight between friends and she sucker punched me and I know it's probably going to be over, so I'm prob- I'm not going to retaliate. And another one where you realize, like, I, I might die. And-, and then even not having any training, something kicks in. So I, I- I'm just imagining that scenario uh, unplay like playing out at that car. Uh, and given given her training, I'm curious what the what the person would look like. I'm curious how that like the DNA that could be there that that's not from that's not from her. That's from a a second party or a third party or a fourth party. It absolutely looked like a struggle, and 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 that's and that's speculation, but just based based on the way that it was left, based on how it was left i I just it it does look like there's a struggle and if whoever abducted her uh was a stranger or was someone that had just been watching her for a few weeks they were probably very surprised with her ability to fight and, and to struggle in that situation because she was so small she may have struggled but i don't know if necessarily she fought like she could have had a weapon on her she also could have just froze you know like 
when you're in a situation like that is fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. I, like people freeze. Like I think that's definitely what I do, but I've never been in that situation. But I think that it is possible that despite her training that she was terrified like too much to do anything. But I'd like to think that she got a piece of him. Yeah, I hadn't thought about this, but um, this conversation led there. Hey, have we ever heard of of cuts or bruises on any of these people these shady characters that we talk about um in Bree's life at this time yeah like someone someone shows up at at you know work the next day and they're like what's up with the what's up with the claw marks on your face or the black eye or yes yeah mm -hmm. uh, yeah i don't think so michelle uh raised a point saying if the abductor had a weapon though it could really change the dynamic i agree I agree. If the if the I can't help but play these scenarios out. I just feel like it helps me uh, to I don't know narrow things down. But if the abductor pulls a gun, what's the reaction? If the abductor pulls a knife, what's the reaction? If someone's got a hammer, what's the reaction? You know, are you getting out of the car and you're running with a with a knife and a hammer, or are you fighting back? Are you running? If someone pulls a gun. Are you going with them? And if you're going with them, if they have a gun then there's probably not going to be that much of a struggle, the appearance of a struggle, right? Something that Chloe actually taught me was never get to the second location. <laughs> so maybe like with all the crap that was out of her car with the swung open doors and everything, maybe she froze initially and then like she probably needed to get dragged away because like her instincts were like, this is bad. Yeah, I mean, I the the car, both car doors were open, you know. So what do we know about the scene? We know that the... The car was was heading down down one way. It ended up backed into an abandoned house about, I want to say, roughly 50 feet off the road. Run into the abandoned house, backed into it so hard that it stuck on the frame of that house. Both doors are open. There's, I believe, a necklace outside on the driver's side on the on the grass and maybe one or two other items out there. So the broken necklace is is widely reported, but um not necessarily confirmed okay but yes there, there were belongings on the ground um that that can be plainly seen plainly be seen in the photographs that were taken by the people the following day loose change water bottle things like that the two doors being open like you know uh probably tells us a lot just one person there trying to get her in some way and lance you know, to your point, trying to play this out. It's hard for me to see this playing out uh, where both doors are left open and the car is left like that if there's just one person um, trying to get Brianna. I agree. I was thinking about it too. And I said, why would both doors be open? And it's probably because one person's trying to open the door and she's trying to sort of like cower backwards or go to the other side. And then either that same person runs back around or a second person basically corners her. Boy, isn't it? Really interesting when you find a car that is uh, sunk in the water, uh, an area of water, like a body of water, or uh, burned, or abandoned in, say, like um, like one of those gravel pits. You know something bad has happened, and you know that someone has made an attempt to hide the car. This is baffling because this could easily be something bad happening prior to that car backing up into the Dutch burn house and someone planting it there in plain sight to create something that would be so uh, mind boggling. Like let's, let's back the car in there. Let's open both doors. Let's throw some shit on the ground, make it look like a struggle and everyone's going to focus on the car. I think it's interesting if you were to approach it that way, where the most, it's so obvious it's, it's it, not like they intended it to be this burned in image for 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 true crime aficionados but that's what happened it, it it's mysterious either way like if it was a struggle or if someone planted that car there have you thought about whether or not that car was planted there to make it look like that and i know i mean that's giving some people a lot of credit but uh well it, it doesn't strike me as staged i think the fact that it was stuck in the house i think it's more likely that uh, whoever is responsible for all this intended for it to be elsewhere and had no choice but to leave it there. That's kind of what I lean closer towards. I think whether it was Brianna who was driving when it crashed or somebody that was moving the car, I don't think that it was uh, placed like that intentionally. I think that was an accident. 
Okay, and Angela in the chat room asks, what do Brianna's close friends think happened to her? It depends on on the day is how they would describe it. And that definitely tracks from my conversations with them. Like sometimes they're convinced that it's it's one thing and then it's another. Like with Katie, she had an interview, I think, in 2010 where um, she's she notably says that she thinks that Brianna owed the wrong people money. And that's not something that she's said since. It was probably just something that she was thinking about at the time. So I don't think that they have like a solid set theory. I think they've thought numerous things over the years. I just feel like there's too many, too many shady characters to even, you just, you keep talking yourself in a circle with all these characters. Yeah, and you're not even talking about shady characters just by opinion. This is these are shady characters by record. <laughs> they have a record um, of violence and a history of violence and a history of associating themselves with people of violence. Um, and it's just so. I remember back when we were really digging into this, it came together in my head like like these circles kind of converging. This this one bad circle converging with this one bad circle and this one bad circle and Brianna's right there in the middle on that night and and I don't like you have to figure out like well who's who who's the worst of them who had the opportunity to do that or is it something totally random like Israel Keys absolutely and then drugs are an element too and I think that makes it even more difficult because I think you can chalk up some inconsistencies. You can chalk some of that up, I think, to just bad memories or just drugs in the past. Yeah, and I mean, the drug thing is really infuri- infuriating too because not only can you chalk up those inconsistencies, you can chalk up this like ridiculous bias, this media bias that was put on it, this um, political bias and this law enforcement bias where, well, she got mixed up with that drug crowd uh, that's not that's not romantic anymore that's not a romantic like with the um lisa lamb case everyone wants that to be one thing they want it to be paranormal they, they, they're just sucked into that and then when you find out it's mental illness it's like that's like real now you know <laughs> that's medication yeah now it's sad so i think that drug angle that drug element really really like hindered things from the jump 